Welcome to section 1.3 in our lecture videos. We're going to be introducing quite a lot of vocabulary in this section that we'll then be applying in different ways in the next section. This video is going to focus on two different sections out of our textbook, and we have some key learning outcomes here uh, which are focused on understanding the difference between different terms, some of which we may have heard before and some of which we will not have heard before. So let's get started with the idea of a constellation. A lot of us have heard that term and have a particular idea in mind um, when we hear it. And it's worth recognizing that when we talked about some of the ancient cultures in the previous video, um, each of those ancient cultures had their own stories for what the night sky looked like and their own set of um, pictures that they imagined that they could see. This image here uh, represents a lot of the pictures that have made it into our kind of modern sense of what constellations are. But one of the really important things for us to understand for this course is scientifically, a constellation is actually a specific patch of sky that the International Astronomical Union, the IAU, decided um, officially to um, break the whole sky up into 88 of these constellations. So rather than these pictures being the thing that we really want in mind for constellations, we actually have to recognize that it is the patch of sky that tries to stay true to a lot of these culturally significant um, pictures, uh, mostly pulling from ancient Greek constellations, uh, while adding a couple of small newer ones like telescopium and microscopium to fill in the gaps. So although we really like these beautiful pictures, um, what we want to make sure we can understand is that by defining the patch of sky, we can then put any sky object into a constellation in the same way that the United States is broken up into different states, and even some field in the middle of nowhere is still part of a particular state. So that idea that you might have started um, with on a constellation, a pattern that you can recognize in the sky, or these line drawings that connect some really bright stars, we actually have a different term that you may not have heard the term before, but it's what you might have in mind when you're thinking about what you can recognize in the sky. And that term is called an asterism. An asterism is a group of bright stars that form a widely recognized pattern. And I have here on the screen a um, kind of stylized map of part of the sky, which includes the full constellation of Ursa Major. Now, can you recognize a um, pattern within the bright stars indicated here? If you need a little bit of help, um, you can focus just on the brightest stars and the connected lines that often form what we think of as the constellation. And now with this um, helpful hint, can you recognize a pattern that maybe you've seen in the sky before? If you have recognized it, then you'll know that it's the Big Dipper. And if um, you're seeing it now, the extra dark lines connecting seven bright stars here is the asterism known as the Big Dipper. Now I want you to pause and make sure to write this down. The Big Dipper is not a constellation. It's an asterism. The Big Dipper is a pattern of stars, but a very small set of stars within a much larger constellation. Now what's important for us to recognize is not all asterisms are just a subset of a constellation. Um, just this particular example and several that we might think of um, have that same uh, have that same criteria. So I want you to pause for a second and think about all the things that you know you've been able to recognize in the night sky. And it might be a long list and it might not be, and that's okay. But at least think of a couple that you've heard of, even if you don't know how to find them in the night sky. So the Big Dipper is one. Let's make a list. We don't have to decide whether it's a constellation or an asterism. All right, and once you've made a list that you're happy with, what was probably on your list was the Little Dipper, not shown here, but the Little Dipper contains the North Star, so it's helpful to know how to find. And um, Orion's Belt was also probably something you wrote down, and maybe you wrote down Orion, but what you're finding in the sky is probably just the seven brightest stars of the full patch of sky we call the Orion um, constellation. On the right side of the screen, um, highlighted in white and a dotted line, is the full patch of sky we call Orion, and I've circled in blue the three stars um, that are the asterism. 
On the left here um, is one of the examples that I wanted to give of an asterism that spans across different constellations. So um, Vega, Deneb, and Altair are the three stars that form the Summer Triangle, a very um, bright set of three stars against a background of much, much less bright stars. So they're easy to pick up, um, pick out as a triangle in the late spring, summer, or early fall skies. Another example that I don't have shown here um, is the Great Square of Pegasus, which the name would suggest is in the constellation Pegasus, but only three of the four corners of the Great Square are actually in that constellation, and the fourth is in Andromeda. It is really useful to have several of these recognizable patterns in your back pocket so you can get familiar with the night sky. If you're in my lab... Um, sections of this course, then we'll get to go to the planetarium and um, see for ourselves several of these uh, popular constellations um, and asterisms. And if you're not, um, you can always go to the planetarium on yourself or explore uh, with friends and family the night sky with the learning that you're going to gain this semester. All right, so let's talk about the star charts that were shown on that previous slide. Before we do get into the details of the star charts, I want us to make sure that we feel confident with a couple of basic ideas about um, how we map things on the Earth. So this slide um, isn't new astronomy, but I'm going to make sure that we're all on the same page about the connections that I want us to be able to, to find for ourselves. So if we've ever had to tell someone exactly where we are and we weren't in a city or town that we could search um, in Google Maps, we might have had to look up our latitude and longitude. So these are coordinates that we tend to um, refer to uh, GPS, so global positioning satellites. That whole system is based on figuring out how far north or south we are from Earth's equator, and that's our latitude in degrees. Grand Rapids, for, for example, is at 43 degrees north latitude. And then our longitude is the number of degrees east or west of the prime meridian, uh, which runs through Greenwich, England, and that probably sounds a little um, random. Why do we care about a particular city in, um, in England? And it's a good question to ask. It's a fairly arbitrary choice that got made uh, way back when we were setting up the longitude system, where it didn't really matter where that point was, but everybody on Earth had to agree where zero was for us to be able to have a system that everyone could use. So it was a um, scientific and uh, political choice to put it there, uh, but now we all count away from that. So um, we are west of Greenwich, England by 85 degrees or so, um, and that longitude number is not that useful to me. It's not that relevant um, to astronomy either. Um, the 43 degrees north, we will learn um, in the next several um, sections why that number is going to be probably in our heads too by the end of the semester. Instead, a way that we often think about how far east or west we are of friends that we might want to schedule time with to um, call on the phone um, or visit are um, time zones. And time zones are also measuring how far east or west we are from a zero point or a standard um, from universal time. And um, that coordinated universal time also runs through Greenwich, England. Um, lucky them. But we are in the Eastern time zone, and um, whether or not we should be is a, is a separate question sometimes when you look at the maps. But what we do want to recognize is that when we measure that in hours and minutes, the point of time zones is that when we talk about noon, we tend to all agree around the globe that noon is roughly in the middle of the day, and 6 a.m. is roughly when we could be thinking about um, sunrise or um, starting our day, although that's way too early for me. But the point of time zones is that everyone has a similar experience with when sunrise and sunset tend to happen on average at their location. So the reason that I introduced all of those is to make sure that we feel confident in then connecting those ideas to brand new stuff we probably have never um, encountered in our life. So the term declination is new to us, but it is also just in degrees, how far above or below the equator we are. Except this time we're talking about the celestial equator, Earth's equator projected out into space. So declination tells us how far above or below the equator we are in the same way that latitude tells us how far above or below the equator we are. 
We're just talking about a slightly different definition of equator. And then for left and right on our sky and in our star charts, we actually do want to think about time zones more effectively than longitude because the term right ascension, also new for us, is the way of describing how far left or right we are in our star charts and it is measured in hours and um, minutes like time zones tend to be. And in the same way that on Earth we kind of had to pick an arbitrary point um, for right ascension, we all globally had to agree on an ar arbitrary starting point, and we picked the vernal equinox, which is actually an important part in our um, sky, but it isn't any better or worse than a different place on our star um, charts that we could all agree for left and right. All right, so when we look at our star charts, and if you're in my lab class, we're going to be um, learning in depth how to read these and how to be able to use them effectively. If you're not in my lab class, we might still reference them for a couple of different projects. But the idea is um, on these star charts, there are numbers telling us where we are left and right, and those numbers are right ascension. And there are numbers up and down telling us where we are, and those numbers are declination. This particular star chart, the text is very small, so I don't expect you to be able to read it, but it only goes from positive 60 degrees declination to negative 60 degrees declination. So for example, it doesn't show the North Star. It doesn't show the stars that are near Earth's North Pole projected into space. Uh, we have different star charts to be able to do that. The last thing I want to draw your attention to before we move on to the next slide is the wavy line that seems to go up and then down again through the star chart, and that's actually tracking where the sun can be found at different times of year. It's a term called the ecliptic, and it's the sun's path through our sky, but it is also showing us the actual orbit of the earth around the sun and that plane of our orbit in the solar system. Because when we realize that three-dimensional nature of the ecliptic, um, what we'll recognize as we see more and more of it is that the ecliptic is also the only real um, place uh, that you can find the moon or any of the planets. They might be a little bit below, five degrees a little bit up above or below, but they're always going to follow roughly that same path that the sun makes its exact path through. And if we were to follow along the ecliptic on our star charts, we would see that there are actually 13 different constellations um, that cross the ecliptic. And out of those 13, 12 form the zodiac that we might be familiar with from astrology. So a brief reminder for us from the previous lecture video, astronomy is the field of science and astrology is the belief system that kind of started in ancient um, Egypt and was the um, basis of the religion of ancient Babylon. Um, and we want to make that distinction, but we also want to remind ourselves that those have um, the same initial roots, observations and caring about the cycles of the sky. We'll see a little bit more about the zodiac constellations in the ecliptic in section 1.5 later on. All right, so let's make sure that we have a sense of those two new terms before we add more to our glossary. So on Earth, up and down is latitude, measured in degrees. On the sky, um, up and down is declination, measured in degrees. On Earth, left and right is longitude, measured in degrees or time zones, and on the sky, left and right is right ascension measured in hours. Okay, so we want to introduce the celestial sphere model. This is a simplified way of thinking about the sky, where before we're learning about star properties or how far away they are, um, all we really want to know is how our view of the sky changes over the course of a night or over the course of a year. For us to be able to do that effectively, the simplest way is to imagine that all of those stars are kind of on this imaginary sphere surrounding the Earth, and that we feel stationary, and we let the whole celestial sphere rotate around us. Now, in reality, it's the Earth that is spinning, but this model helps us be able to connect what we actually see in our night sky with a way to be able to predict what we expect to see in an hour or in a month. All right, so we need a lot of terms to feel confident with this celestial sphere model. The rest of this video will be introducing terms, and then all of the next video will be on getting comfortable with the model as a whole. All right, 
So um, we want to start with a set of terms, both on this slide and the next, that refer to our specific view as the observer or some imaginary observer in a particular location. So for example, we could imagine calling up our friend in Florida and asking them to kind of talk about what they see in their night sky, um, and they would have these specific directions to look. So beyond the compass directions of north, east, south, and west, we need to identify up and down in our directions, but we need to specify really specific um, that straight up is a direction in the same way that exactly facing north is a direction, not just northeast or northwest. So exactly straight up has a special term that we definitely want to have in our vocabulary. It's called zenith. Um, one of the common misconceptions that we're going to try to confront over the next several videos is that somehow the sun is always passing through our zenith um, every day at noon, and that is not the case. Um, it's a very easily observed um, misconception, um, but by having that term, we can recognize that there is only one location that's directly overhead. There's a lot of above us, but there's only one exact straight up, so we use that term zenith to describe it. Now, if you're curious, there is a straight down, and that's nadir, um, and that's a term used in astronomy too, but because we don't really care that much about what's happening um, below our feet since we can't see it, we're not really going to see that term again. So um, it is there, uh, but not really key to our, our learning goals. And then exactly in between um, zenith and nadir, all along in a nice flat plane all around us is the horizon. Now, we tend to use the horizon in our everyday lives in a very similar way, but in astronomy, a horizon is going to be this kind of simplified, perfect little flat plane. We don't care that there might be a tree in the way in one direction or a couple buildings blocking our view in another. It's where the sky should meet the ground if, if we had a nice flat field all around us. And then the last key observer-centered term that we want to make sure we understand is the meridian. Now the um, celestial meridian is the line that goes from perfectly north, due north, directly overhead to our zenith, and then hits per, um, exactly at the horizon due south. That means that it will also go through nadir, directly below us, as well as two special points we're going to introduce in the next slide, the north celestial pole, so Earth's North Pole projected into space, that's where we find the North Star, so the meridian goes through the North Star, and the South Celestial Pole, which from Grand Rapids we cannot observe, but it's the Earth's South Pole projected into space as well. With these terms, zenith, meridian, and horizon, these three observer-centered terms that we care about, we can then start to picture what happens when a star moves through our field of view. So let's focus on the sun, because that's easier for us to picture. Uh, the sun becomes visible when it rises. We call that sunrise. And what it's doing is going from below our horizon to going above our horizon. So anything that goes from below our horizon to above our horizon rises. It then gets higher in the sky. It is a common misconception that we're going to fight um, in the next couple of videos, um, it does not reach our zenith. The sun never, in Grand Rapids, the sun never reaches our zenith. But it does get to a highest point, and that ha tends to happen around noon. And when it does reach its highest point, it is along the meridian. So that term is really useful and important to us because it is as high as the sun is going to get will fall somewhere along this north-south line. We're going to see it high in the southern sky along the meridian. And then it will get lower in the sky, and then when the sun leaves our field of view, we call it sunset, so anything that goes from above our horizon to below our horizon is setting. Not all stars rise and set, but all of them move, and so all of the stars get higher in the sky, they will cross the meridian at their highest point, and then they will get lower in the sky. Even stars that do not ever get above our horizon are doing the same motion, we just never get to see any of it. All right, so the other terms that we need um, have nothing to do with a particular observer. They are true for everyone on Earth. They are simply points that we could draw on a star chart um, that we can identify as important fixed sky points. Um, and they're pretty straightforward. I've actually introduced all three of them um, through the discussion with you already. 
The celestial equator is Earth's equator, projected into space. The North Celestial Pole is the North Pole, projected into space. And the South Celestial Pole is, you guessed it, the South Pole, projected into space. This diagram from our um, textbook shows all three of those together. The really important thing for us to recognize is that the North Celestial Pole, NCP, we'll see that a lot, um, is a sky point. It's not a star, it is a sky point. But we are very lucky in the Northern Hemisphere that we do have a bright star called Polaris that is right next to the North Celestial Pole. There is no South Star. There is no single bright star that is close enough to the South Celestial Pole to be meaningful or useful. So we're, we're quite lucky to have a North Star. Um, and in the previous video, we talked about precession and how we don't always have a North Star. So if you don't remember that, we might go back to the slides to, to check that out briefly. All right, so a couple of questions for us to ponder before we wrap up this um, kind of glossary video. Um, to help us think about how these terms are really settling into our brain, and you can review your notes as much as you want to, I want you to pause the video and think about um, how you would answer the three um, bullet points here. So pause the video for as much as you like. I do want you to try to think through these, and then we'll talk about them briefly once you come back from pausing. All right. So what's currently at your zenith? Um, for me, I have a ceiling, right? There's going to be um, one star maybe that is directly overhead, but if it's daytime, I'm not going to see it even if I go outside or if it's cloudy. Um, and at night, there would only be one single direction that has... Um, a potential to have a star there, there's a lot of stars that will never reach our zenith. For my horizon, I'm indoors, so again, I don't see that much, um, but I hope that you looked around and you kind of looked in all directions to remind yourself that the horizon is in all directions around you. Zenith is one single point, the horizon's like a hula hoop all around you. Now that drawing, I really suggest that you draw that out step by step so that you can feel confident understanding the terms. Um, on the next slide, I'll note that I'll have a whole separate video of me drawing that out that you can follow along with, especially if you feel like you're struggling a little bit, um, because labeling that drawing is going to be really, really useful and helpful for really building that model into our mental framework. And then for all of the vocabulary terms that we learned today, I really strongly encourage you to choose a friend or family member or even a pet who's going to sit there patiently and explain in your own words what each of those mean, because that will help kind of check um, for yourself whether those words are sinking in and they make sense or whether you might want to check in with me um, to get a little bit of clarification or even check the lecture notes or the textbook. All right, so... We'll end our video here. Um, I do want to note that this is the first of many deeper look videos that we're going to have interspersed. Um, they are going to look very different than this one. They aren't going to be slides. They're going to be me at a cool light board describing things. And every time that we have one of these deeper look videos, I'm going to encourage you to um, draw things along with me because when you draw it out by hand, even on a piece of paper, if it's separate from digital notes that you have, or even if you don't really like your drawing skills, um, I really strongly encourage you to draw with me because that really helps keep it in your brain and, and kind of lock in those ideas. So we will have in our kind of set of um, videos that we're meant to watch a deeper look video next, and then we'll return to the celestial sphere with some um, more analysis in our next lecture video. So I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for watching.